The first speaker of today is Marion Gidea from Yeshiva University. Uh, he will speak about a geometric mechanism of Arnold diffusion in the a priori stable case. Um, so I'm uh, very happy to be here. So it's a wonderful workshop in a wonderful city. So I'm very grateful for the organizers for for the opportunity to be here. So the title of uh, the talk is A Geometric Mechanism of Arnold Diffusion in the a priori stable case. And this is joint work with uh, Jean-Pierre Marco. So, um, uh, the, the talk is essentially about the uh, Hamiltonian system, so everything is uh, as conservative as possible and almost every uh, geometric object that I will uh, be referring to is uh, symplectic. So uh, in a way, it, uh, I think it fits uh, very well with the theme of the conference. But uh, on the other hand, uh, what I will be talking about is probably uh, very different from uh, some of the previous talks. So in some of the previous talks, if I can summarize, so we have a, uh, a very general type of system. So you have like a, a contact manifold and the rib flow and so on. And uh, you are trying uh, in a very general class of systems to prove the existence of one periodic orbit, maybe two periodic orbits, maybe infinitely many periodic orbits. So the type of systems that I'm going to refer to, it's very different. So you, you start with a system, with a Hamiltonian system that is more or less explicit. It's basically, we'll start with an integrable Hamiltonian system. And every orbit is either periodic or quasi-periodic. So you already start with a bunch of orbits that lots of them, all of them that are periodic and quasi-periodic. So the point is that you apply uh, a small perturbation to the system. And uh, of course, uh, many of the periodic and quasi-periodic orbits will survive the perturbation. So you are interested in uh, orbits that are far from the original periodic or quasi-periodic ones. So orbits that travel very far, become very different from the ones in the uh, unperturbed system. So in some sense, this talk is at the other end of the spectrum. So uh, at one end of the spectrum, you have very general system, and you are happy if you find uh, a few periodic orbits. Here, you start with a system that has lots of regular dynamics. And what you want, you want uh, orbits that uh, are far from those that are periodic or quasi-periodic. So in the previous talks, the periodic orbits were your friend. And in some sense, in this talk, the periodic orbits are your enemy. So you do anything you want to avoid them, to move uh, around them, to, to, do, to avoid them. That's it. So um, this, the motivation, it's a, a conjecture by Arnold uh, in uh, 1964. So uh, I'll first uh, make the, uh, describe it in, a, in an informal way. So you start with an integrable Hamiltonian system. So i phi is in, uh, let's say, Rn tn. And the condition is n greater than or equal to 3. And um, the conjecture is that for typical h0 and 
generic H1, there exists epsilon positive such that for each epsilon there is an orbit of the system So if epsilon is equal to 0, so this is the perturbation, and epsilon is the size of the perturbation. So your original system, your in, it's, a, it's an integrable system. So it can be written in terms of the uh, action coordinate only. And uh, the, the phase space is uh, foliated uh, by uh, invariant uh, tori, and each torus corresponds to an action level set. So in the integrable case, if you start at some action level set, you are going to stay on that action level set forever. So you have like uh, uh, stability over infinite time. So now the question is that if you add a small perturbation, whether you can uh, obtain for all, for every single perturbation that for for all epsilon that is small enough, if you find the trajectories of the Hamiltonian system for which the action changes by some quantity that is independent of the size of the perturbation. So you make epsilon smaller, you may be able to find another trajectory that travels some distance, and the distance does not depend on the size of the perturbation. So um, I'm not putting here, I didn't write anything specific about the regularity of the system, so the question can be asked in uh, uh, the CR class or in the analytic class. So most of the results that uh, have been achieved so far are not in the analytic class, so most of them are in the, uh, some CR. And uh, I uh, uh, leave undefined for the moment the terms typical and the terms generic. So there are several types of uh, subsist, uh, several classes of of, uh, of models that one con can consider here, and what typical means and what generic means uh, sort of depends on on the questions that you're asking. So uh, generic, for example, can mean that uh, your perturbation H1 is in an open dense uh, set of of uh, Hamiltonians, or it can mean uh, something which is weaker. So it's the so-called cast residual class, which was defined by Mother, and I'll uh, give some, some examples, of, some uh, explanation about this. So, um, so there is a classification which is due to uh, Kierke and Galavoti. or something, or uh, 94. So uh, you have a priori unstable Hamiltonians. So a priori unstable, it means that uh, in the unperturbed system, H0 has uh, uh, some hyperbolic variables. plus action angle. So essentially, before you put the uh, perturbation on, so what you have, you have a product of rotators and penduli, and then you are going to add the perturbation. So you have hyperbolicity in the unperturbed system already. Um, so uh, examples are exactly uh, systems of uh, penduli and rotators. 
so this is uh, an So uh, what you have here, it's a, a typical case of a, a, a priori unstable system. So you have uh, a rotator part, which corresponds to this uh, uh, cartoon. And uh, you have a finite number of penduli, which corresponds to, to this part of the cartoon. And then you, you add a perturbation that uh, couples the rotators with the penduli. And uh, the question is, again, to prove the existence of uh, uh, trajectories for which uh, the action of the rotator changes by some quantity which is independent of the size of the perturbation. So, and uh, the a priori stable uh, case is when H0 depends on action, action, angle variables only, well, uh, so basically it corresponds to, to a situation when in the uh, unperturbed system you only see like, uh, like rotators. No, no hyperbolicity appears in the unperturbed system. So, um, so there are a uh, lot of results in the a priori unstable case. So there are uh, actually uh, too many that uh, it will take me quite a lot uh, of time to, to mention them. But in the a priori stable case, this is uh, only recently that some progress has been achieved. So uh, I'd like to mention that Mother was the one who uh, came up with uh, a lot of ideas and uh, strategies to, to overcome the a priori stable case. And uh, unfortunately, uh, he passed uh, away before he was able to present uh, the results in, uh, in a complete uh, fashion. And uh, then they are results by uh, Kaloshin and collaborators. So uh, Bernard Kaloshin and Zhang. So I think this is 2012. And Kaloshin and Zhang, uh, maybe 2012 as well. Uh, another group of results comes from uh, C.Q. Cheng and C.Q. Cheng and Jin Xin Shue, 2015. And uh, then another type of uh, group of results is from Marco and So essentially, the, the results of uh, Bernard uh, Kaloshin and collaborators uh, co combine geometric methods with variational methods. Uh, the methods of uh, Cheng and collaborators are uh, mostly variational. And uh, the results of Marco and Marco and myself are uh, mostly geometric. And uh, what I'll, I'm going to describe, I'm going to describe uh, some aspect of this work. So um, let me just say a few words about uh, uh, the type of questions that uh, people are asking about uh, the Arnold diffusion. 
and uh, the type of applications that uh, people have in mind. So, okay, so the very basic uh, question is whether you find the trajectories that uh, displace in the action variable by some quantity that is independent of the size uh, of the perturbation. But then uh, you can ask more specific question. I mean, uh, you can ask how many orbits like that there exist. So can you say something about uh, the Lebesgue measure of such orbits? Can you say something about the Hausdorff dimension of such orbits? There are questions if you can uh, find symbolic dynamics for this system. So can you make uh, not only trajectories that uh, increase in the action variable by some quantity, but they you put yourself some targets in the action space, and can you find orbits that are hitting those targets in the prescribed order? You can ask questions about um, what is the time of diffusion, how long it takes to move at a distance of order one in action space, what is the fastest speed that you can get by, and uh, there are also questions, uh, uh, natural questions like, okay, so what kind of distribution, if you start with some initial distribution of initial condition and let them uh, undergo the diffusion process, I, I mean, the, this Arnold diffusion, does it follow a, a diffusion process in the stochastic sense or, it's, or you, you will see some other type of uh, distribution as the time goes on? So. Uh, Many of the, so there are some partial answers for some of these questions, but uh, this is uh, an uh, active area of research, and uh, for some of the other questions, there, there is uh, ongoing work. Some of the motivation for this. Uh, of course, this is an interesting uh, problem by itself, so it goes back to the Poincaré uh, question uh, or what he called the fundamental problem of dynamics to understand the, uh, what happens to the trajectories in a nearly integrable Hamiltonian systems, what, hap what is going on with them, and his motivation was um, inspired by celestial mechanics. So uh, part of the motivation for the Arnold diffusion uh, problem is, uh, comes from celestial mechanics, and there is a, a paper of uh, um, Kaloshin and collaborators about uh, the distribution of the gaps, the Kirkwood gaps in the asteroid belt, and uh, they have an explanation of, of the gaps in terms of the Arnold diffusion. So it's important to, to, to mention here that uh, in either class of systems, the diffusion time is going to be very long the diffusion, it's a very slow phenomenon. So that's why uh, uh, if you are hoping to see some Arnold diffusion in the solar system, it's going to happen over, uh, and over millions, hundreds of millions, and so on, of years. So it's going to be a very slow process, and uh, Kirkwood gaps seems like a good motivation to study that. Uh, but uh, more recently, uh, there is... Uh, uh, interest from the people who work in particle accelerators. So there, there are similar models uh, like this one that uh, describe the motion of uh, particles in a uh, particle, charged particles in a uh, magnetic field, in a uh, particle accelerator. And uh, in these uh, systems, people are interested to prevent diffusion to happen. And the diffusion time, it's much shorter. So it's uh, at most hours. So it's a much more natural type of question that you put and you can actually see experimentally. So, uh, so let me uh, quickly, so let me state the main result uh, uh, of Marco. And then uh, I'm going to explain what is our joint work. So. Uh, Marco is the following. So you have uh, you are the result is only for three degree of freedom Hamiltonian systems. 
and the unperturbed Hamiltonian is uh, Tonelli. So you have convexity, and you have a superlinear growth. So um, there exists a set, let me call it. So this is going to be a set of perturbations, which I'm going to describe, such that for Um, uh, let me give you a little bit. Uh, so you give yourself also a energy level which is bigger than the minimum energy level for the unperturbed Hamiltonian. You are also uh, so you fix the energy of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. So you are in action space, which is actually R3. So when you fix uh, the energy level, so this is going to be a, uh, a surface, like a, uh, let's say a sphere in R3. And uh, you uh, give yourself a collection of open sets, so you so the objective would be that um, to find trajectories. So you have some conditions on the unperturbed system, and you are going to select uh, the perturbations from some class of systems. So you are going to select H1 uh, from uh, some set. So maybe here, this is the conclusion. The conclusion is that there exists a class of uh, perturbation for which, for each epsilon H1 in R epsilon, there exists a trajectory of the Hamiltonian system such that uh, I T I is in O I for I equals one. Okay, so the trajectories live in in the phase space. So essentially, they live in uh, R n. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the statement of the theorem, and all I have to explain to you now is how do you select um, these perturbations. So uh, this is the uh, set of perturbations that satisfy the so-called uh, Mather um, cusp genericity condition or cusp residual condition. So first, you start with uh, uh, you normalize uh, all possible perturbation. So you take the sphere of in some regularity class. So throughout the talk, uh, we are working in CR with R sufficiently large. 
And there exists a function epsilon zero, which is defined on the sphere and takes uh, values greater than or equal to zero. So this is a lower semi-continuous. And it's positive on an open dense set. So let me draw a picture at this point. So this is the sphere of uh, uh, normalized perturbations. And what do you do first? Uh, you have to eliminate some bad directions. So if your uh, perturbation it happens to be in one of the bad directions, you cannot achieve diffusion. So you have to eliminate a bunch of uh, directions. And what you're left with are the uh, good directions on the sphere. And these good directions form an open dense set. So why do you need to eliminate some directions? So imagine that this is your unperturbed Hamiltonian, very simple. And then when I add the perturbation, the perturbation is of this form. So um, so when I combine these two, what I'm going to get, I'm going to get an uncoupled system. So the, the combined system has the i1, i2, and i3 variables. So i3 with uh, phi3, they create a pendulum subsystem. But uh, the coordinate, what happens in the coordinate i1 and i2 and i3 are independent of each other. So because this is a product system, you cannot achieve uh, diffusion in this direction. So you have to eliminate. So this is an example of a bad direction, and you have to eliminate those bad directions. And of course, that if you are going to be very close to one of these bad directions, it's going to be much harder to achieve direction. So if you are not so close to these bad directions, it's going to be easier. So harder and easier is measured in, this, in terms of this function. And you can imagine that this function will put some restriction on the perturbation. So what you get, you are going to get a generalized sphere. So this is like a B. So this is the set of perturbation Uh, when uh, epsilon of is less than So you are allowed to move in the other directions, but uh, the, uh, how much you can move depends on the particular direction. So basically, you are going to get a generalized ball is something like this. So basically, in some directions, you can allow your perturbation to be bigger. In some directions, the perturbation is going to be smaller. And in some directions, you cannot simply have the perturbation from those particular bad directions. So uh, now, the set of Good, at the end of the day, this set of good perturbations that you are going to use for to achieve diffusing orbits is going to be um, uh, 
So the bottom line of this story is that this set of good perturbations is open and dense in B. So not all of these uh, perturbations will work for you, unfortunately. So you have to select one more time an open dense set of perturbations out of this generalized ball. So and this is the uh, mother cat's residual condition. Okay. So uh, this is as this is a little bit involved. So let me take uh, just a couple of moments to to see if there are any questions about the the setup, about the formulation of the theorem, or anything else. Yes, please. Yes. So these are uh, open sets in the action space. Yes? So on the energy level. So the sum manifold of uh, uh, R three is the energy manifold. So you fix the energy. So the system, it's uh, uh, the unperturbed system, and the perturbed system is Hamiltonian. It's uh, autonomous. It's time dependent. So you you choose your uh, you can choose your open balls in the energy space, uh, uh, and then. Um, Yes, yes. No, I think it's, you're right. So I think I should draw this in Rn. So that's a very good point. So these are, yes. So these are uh, in Rn. So that's a bad drawing. So these are the targets uh, that you want to visit. And, uh, but the trajectories do not live in the action space. So I think the main point that I was trying to make here is that the trajectories themselves, uh, they live in the energy manifold. But uh, if you look at uh, the action of these trajectories, they have to visit those particular open sets in the action space. Yes, thank you. So other questions, yes? So, uh, so the, so the cusp is a condition. So, OK, so the, the cusps are, let's say, these directions are, are the cusps. So uh, basically, there are some around the bed uh, uh, directions. You have some sort of cones that you have to eliminate. And uh, what is left is this uh, generalized sphere from which you have to make one more selection of uh, open, uh, an open dense set of uh, of, of uh, perturbations that uh, are going to achieve diffusion. Uh, I don't know any relation with Whitney Caster. Uh, other questions? Yes? So uh, this is a, this can be viewed, yes. So this can be viewed as a mechanism to, to gain energy. Uh, so you can, uh, your objective can be as simple as that. So you want to increase energy, or you can uh, decrease energy, or uh, uh, this is like uh, you want to have some sort of symbolic dynamics in, in terms of the action space, which means that you want the energy to grow or decay in very specific ways to, to have certain targets of the energy. So uh, uh, do people use this in, in practice? So uh, this is a tricky question. So the Arnold diffusion as a, as a problem, the, the, it's difficult when you let the perturbation go uh, very, very small, and you want to prove that uh, the diffusing orbits exist for all small enough perturbations. So uh, in practice, in many problems, your perturbation is uh, not such fantastically small, so it's uh, uh, reasonably big. So what you use, you essentially use, you have some mechanism of diffusion. So you find some pathways along which the orbit is diffused. And uh, uh, then you use uh, 
these geometric mechanisms to diffuse in practice in a more realistic ways. But uh, in the ap most of the applications that uh, present practical interest, the perturbation is not fantastically small. Other questions? Okay, so uh, let me say a few words about the proof. So uh, the, the proof, it's uh, uh, very long and technical, and it has many steps. And actually, it's Marco who uh, put together the proof for the Arnold diffusion problem. And our joint work refers to a certain particular, a certain uh, uh, segment of the proof. So essentially, the proof for diffusion has three steps. First. You look at the geometric structures that organize the dynamics. So this is like a Poincaré philosophy. So resonances in the system determine chains of normally hyperbolic invariant cylinders. So this is Marco. A second step is that under certain conditions, there are trajectories that uh, diffuse along these chains. And this is the uh, work of Marco and myself. And those conditions are generic. And uh, this is Marco again. So basically, uh, I'll try to explain a little bit about what is the geometric skeleton, and then how do you achieve diffusion once you take the geometric skeleton for granted? So uh, again, you are in the action space. And in the action space, uh, you look at the resonances. So the resonances are uh, surfaces of the type omega uh, dot k equal to 0. So omega is dh0 di. So these are the frequencies of the motion. And k is integer. So this is a condition of the type So if we are taking this example as a for illustration only so uh, what you have you have planes that cut uh, the so the energy level it's a it's a sphere it's a, and uh, uh, the resonances determine place that cut the sphere. So, and these are called uh, simple resonances. But of course, that uh, different planes. Uh, I mean, you have infinitely many such planes, and they intersect. And the places where they intersect are double resonances. So you have. <coughs> And uh, obviously, there are lots of double resonances. And then uh, some resonances are not as bad as the other. So 
you can sort of quantify there exists some uh, k such that for k uh, these are uh, almost simple resonances And if uh, this is, these are strong double resonances. And this has a physical correspondence, so the diffusion mostly happens along strong double resonances. The weaker is the resonance, the weaker is the diffusion along this. And, uh, the, the next step is to construct along the simple and almost simple resonances chains of cylinders and the chains of cylinders. So the chains of cylinders exist in the unperturbed system. So this is everything happens in the action space before you turn on the perturbation. And when you turn on the perturbation, what you obtain is the following. So you have a long simple plus almost simple resonances. You get chains of cylinders. So each cylinder is a three-dimensional cylinder with a boundary. And it's uh, normally hyperbolic. And along double resonances, at double resonances, you have so-called uh, singular cylinders. So a uh, so first you have cylinders that look like that. And at double resonances, you have a, a cylinder with a, a, with a disk removed, with a three-dimensional disk removed. So these are the singular ones. So um, So what are the properties? So uh, for each uh, singular cylinder that you have that the st there exist stable and unstable manifolds. Which intersect. Also, you have that the stable manifold of one cylinder is intersecting the st stable manifold of the next cylinder in the chain. And uh, another condition that you get out of this construction is that uh, for each uh, OJ, there exists a cylinder and a uh, essential torus on the cylinder. Such that uh, T intersect OJ. So the idea is that you have a network, so you have some targets that you want to visit. And uh, you use the resonances to navigate and to get from uh, one uh, target to another. So you move as long as possible along simple resonances and almost simple resonances. Then you switch direction at double resonances. You go to the next target, and then you go to the next target, and so on. So uh, this is the, the basic idea of the construction. So. It turns out that uh, you can 
so these are the bad spots where, where you cannot, uh, the double resonances give you some, some technical uh, problems, but the idea is that in this construction, you can avoid going through the double resonances, so you, you go around them, and basically at the end of the day, what you follow is a chain of, uh, of three-dimensional cylinders which have homoclinic connections, and they also have heteroclinic connections. So the double resonances are uh, avoided. So this is a, a very important uh, technical aspect of our construction. And there are uh, numerical experiments by Carles uh, Simon, uh, Gelfrich, and Vieiro that uh, showed that if you let orbits uh, diffuse in, in a concrete system, they, are, they become slower and slower when approaching the double resonances. And they are likely to jump from one simple resonance to another simple resonance. So, uh, our, uh, so this theoretical uh, construction seems to be in agreement with the numerical experiments. So, um, What you do at the next step, you, uh, you reduce the dynamics. So this theorem is for three degrees of freedom Hamiltonian system. So it's a low dimensional type of system. And the whole point of this construction is you can reduce these to a two dimensional types of dynamics. So you, you can uh, use Poincare section. you obtain the following setup. So you, you take each of these cylinders and you put a, a global surface of section on it. And then you are talking about the dynamics uh, on the global surface of section and the outer dynamics that uh, corresponds to the hyperbolic direction. So maybe I should say here uh, a little bit uh, what is a normally hyperbolic invariant cylinder. So this is an invariant cylinder, so if the flow, it's invariant for the flow. And the normal hyperbolicity means that uh, in the normal direction, you have uh, in some direction that is exponentially contracting, some dimension that is exponentially uh, expanding. And uh, the contraction and expansion rates in the normal directions are dominating whatever contraction and expansion rates you have for the flow restricted to the cylinder. And what you also have here, so you have the, con so once you have normal hyperbolicity, it means that for each of these cylinders, you have stable and unstable manifolds that are uh, foliated by uh, stable and unstable fibers of points. And the first condition is that, okay, so you have intersection of the stable and unstable manifolds of each cylinder. So you can go up and go down. So this is the intersection. And you also have, uh, since you have a bunch of cylinders, you are also able to move from one cylinder to the next. So this is Ci plus 1. So uh, at the end of the day, what you have, you have a finite chain of such cylinders. And what you try to do, you try to move along one cylinder using both the inner dynamics restricted to the cylinder and the outer dynamics along the homoclinic to the cylinder. You hope to get from one end of the cylinder to the other end. At the other end, you hope to jump with a, a longer heteroclinic connection to the uh, next cylinder and do the same thing again. So in this picture, if you, if you are able to do that, so you are moving along these chains of cylinder. Here, you are avoiding the double resonance. You move along the next chain of cylinders and so on. And in this way, you visit your targets in the prescribed order. So uh, by using Poincare sections, 
what you obtain is that uh, instead of talking about a three-dimensional cylinder, all of the sudden you have a much simpler picture. So you have annuli, AI, AI plus one, and so on. So I'm just drawing, uh, so these are the uh, boundary uh, of uh, each annulus. And uh, I'm s just selecting here some neighborhoods of each boundary component. So what you are trying to, to prove is use the inner dynamics restricted to this annulus to move from the lower boundary to the upper boundary and uh, then use the outer dynamics to move to the next annulus, and so on. So uh, what you have, so uh, after reduction, you have a collection of annuli. AI, I goes from 1 to whatever n. The inner dynamics uh, is So the Poincaré map on each annulus turns out to be uh, simplex, uh, area preserving twist map. And you also have uh, to describe the outer dynamics, and you can describe the outer dynamics by a geometric map which is referred to as the scattering map. So this is uh, a map from, it's a partially defined map. So it may not be defined at all points on the annulus, but is defined on open sets of such points. And you also have uh, similar maps from one cylinder to the next, to one annulus to the next. So this is like scattering map. So let me describe uh, quickly what are these uh, scattering maps. So these are geometrically defined scattering maps. So imagine that this is your annulus. And for each point you have, and you fix maybe some homoclinic intersection. And you pick a point on the homoclinic intersection. So this point will sit on a unique unstable fiber of a point and will also lie on the stable fiber of some uniquely defined point. So the scattering map is x minus goes to x plus. So one warning is that the scattering map is not uh, truly, it's, it gives you uh, a way to describe the outer dynamics, the dynamics along the homoclinic orbits, but it's not truly mimicking what happens along the homoclinic orbit. So the homoclinic orbits, if you start with the homoclinic uh, orbit of x, so in negative time, it will approach the negative uh, image of x minus, and in positive time, it will approach the positive uh, orbit of x plus. But uh, it's not that the homoclinic trajectories goes from x minus to x plus. So, um, and uh, del sums de la llave and Sarah in a paper in 2008, they show that this is a symplectic. So uh, the theorem, what we proved with uh, Marco is the following. So first of all, the, the, 
The difficult part is to travel on an annulus from the bottom to the top. Then you are going to use the heteroclinic connection to go to the next annulus. You are going to arrive at the bottom of the annulus and you are going to repeat the construction. So uh, the, the simplest uh, proposition that I can write is in terms of a single annulus. So you assume that you have a single annulus like that for A and uh, five psi. So I'm just going to drop the subscript. So phi stands for uh, the inner dynamics, psi for the outer dynamics. So assuming we make some technical assumptions that are generic. So phi is a special twist map. And phi and psi are in general position. Then there exist trajectories of the poly system. So these are orbits of the type with uh, y0 near the lower boundary and yn near the upper boundary of the annulus. So moreover, if delta, if I give you some positive delta, there are trajectories as above that visit the delta neighborhood of every essential torus, well, essential circle in A. So an essential circle, it's something that goes around the annulus. So the idea is that you, you can find uh, pseudo orbits or orbits of the poly system. So you are iterating the inner dynamics for a number of times. You apply the outer dynamics and uh, you apply the inner dynamics again for a number of times. So you create s such uh, pseudo orbits that uh, use the two dynamics. You can visit with an error of delta every single essential circle in between, and you can arrive at the top. So, two minutes? Three minutes, okay. So since, since I have three minutes left, so I can uh, give uh, only a rough idea of the proof. So uh, actually, the, the techniques of the proofs are, uh, are very simple and are uh, point set topology. So uh, there is a result of, of a well-known result of Birchhoff is that if you have a, a twist map of the annulus and if you have a Birchhoff zone of instability, there are trajectories that go from a neighborhood of the lower boundary of the Birchhoff zone to the upper boundary of the Birchhoff zone of instability. But this assumes that you have a Birchhoff zone of instability in between, which means that there is no essential invariant torus. If you have essential uh, invariant tori, so the dynamics get separated, so you have to do something else. So uh, you'd like to use the outer dynamics to jump over uh, these, these essential circles. So there is a result of uh, Merkel in 2002 that says that if you give yourself 
a twist map and uh, another map which you only require to be area preserving if you are going to iterate these two maps at random then you can go from the um, lower boundary to the upper boundary to a neighborhood of the upper boundary so uh, of course that the uh, there, there are some conditions on the uh, second map the one which is just area preserving and those conditions are simply saying that the second map does not have any essential uh, does not leave invariant any of the essential circles for the twist map so as long as they do not have invariant circles in common when you iterate them at random then uh, you can move from the one boundary of the annals to the other boundary of the annals um, but it's uh, in Merkel it's very uh, important part of the argument that uh, both maps are globally defined so in this construction as I mentioned before you use you describe the, the outer dynamics via the scattering map which is not globally defined so essentially you have to adapt uh, these arguments uh, from Merkel in order to work with uh, maps that are not globally defined and you have to put uh, some conditions that the inner dynamics and the outer dynamics are in general position so um, I guess that I won't have time to go through the technicalities of uh, how this construction works but uh, just to, to summarize so once you have all of these complicated construction in place uh, at the end of the day to, mo to move along these uh, cylinders or along the corresponding uh, annuli you go back to the arguments of Birkhoff of crossing Birkhoff zone of instability or uh, if you wish to the more uh, recent uh, construction of, of Merkel which you have to adapt for uh, maps that are not globally defined and once you have this uh, pseudo orbit there is a shadowing result so the, the maybe the punchline is that given such uh, pseudo orbits or orbits of the poly systems as in star there exist true orbits that shadow them so this is a shadowing lemma for normally hyperbolic invariant manifolds by uh, myself, De La Liave, and Sarah, 2014. So your system is not purely hyperbolic, so the typical shadowing lemma for hyperbolic systems does not apply and uh, we, when you go to the normally hyperbolic system if you try to say is the corresponding shadow lemma true the answer is no it is not true but uh, this is a very special situation in which one of the map is uh, the inner map and the other map is not just any map is is just uh, this uh, uh, scattering map along the uh, homoclinic orbits and you have to uh, be a little bit careful how you construct these pseudo orbits so you have to construct uh, the powers of the inner dynamics large enough you have to involve uh, some other uh, like Poincaré recurrence theorem but at the end of the day once you construct these uh, fake orbits the pseudo orbits or the orbits of the poly system that uh, move from one end of the annulus to the other end at the end of the day you are going to get true orbits that achieve the same result so sorry for taking you some few minutes more and thank you